This tutorial will demonstrate how to set up and program an ESP32 microcontroller running MicroPython from a Raspberry Pi. All my tutorials are fast paced, but the code notes, updates, and more are available on my website, and as always, a link will be placed in the description. Here's an ESP32 breakout board connected to a 16x2 LCD display, showing temperature readings from a DS18B20 sensor connected via a one wire interface. This is a standalone setup, but ESP32s can easily transmit temperature and other sensor data wirelessly from multiple remote locations to a central server such as a Raspberry Pi. Here's a JQ6500 sound module connected via UART to an ESP32. The module lets you store and play audio files. A motion detector is also connected to a GPL input pin. When motion is detected, an interrupt fires and a sound plays. You are not authorized to access this facility. The ESP32 is a very powerful and versatile chip. Here's a generic ESP32 breakout board that I got on eBay for a few dollars. There are other varieties such as the Wemos Lowland 32, which I just ordered for an upcoming video because it has a lithium battery interface with charging. They're sold on AliExpress for around the same price as my generic eBay version. Adafruit also has an ESP32 board with battery support called the Huzza 32. It's part of their Feather series. It's more expensive, but they offer a large selection of add-on boards with features such as a real-time clock, SD card, displays, GPS, and more. Another board is the PyCom YPi 2.0, which is compact, has an RGB LED, and has an external antenna option. The ESP32 is designed for efficient Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, including Bluetooth Low Energy, or BLE. It has a powerful 240 MHz dual-core microcontroller with 520K of SRAM. The chip is designed for mobile devices, so it has ultra-low power consumption. There are 32 GPIO pins with support for I2C, I2S, SPI, and UART. In addition, it has multiple analog to digital channels and digital to analog, hardware accelerated encryption, pulse width modulation, capacitance touch interfaces, and a bunch more. The built-in Wi-Fi makes the ESP32 a great solution for remote devices such as sensors, inputs, and relays. If there's interest, I'll probably turn this video into a series that demonstrates connecting sensors to the ESP32 in detail and using network messaging protocols such as MQTT to report data back to the Pi wirelessly. One of the main reasons I like the ESP32 is that you can program it in Python, more specifically MicroPython, a very efficient streamlined version of the Python 3 programming language, which is optimized to run on microcontrollers such as the ESP32. The Raspberry Pi is great for many projects, but it's a full-fledged computer with a Linux operating system. For simple repetitive tasks such as monitoring sensors and controlling relays, it's often easier, cheaper, more reliable, and more efficient to use a microcontroller, which boots up instantly and just runs your program. Especially if your project uses batteries or solar, because the ESP32 uses a fraction of the power required by the Pi. Also, many sensors are susceptible to interference, especially on longer wire runs. A more reliable approach is to connect the sensor with a short wire to an ESP32 and then transmit the results using Ethernet or a wireless protocol. To get started, the MicroPython firmware needs to be uploaded to the ESP32. This can be done with a simple USB cable, which provides a two-way serial interface between the Pi and the ESP32. It also provides 5-volt power. On a breadboard, I have an ESP32 breakout board. Next to the board is an old Raspberry Pi B+, but any Pi should work. I'll plug one end of the USB cable into the Pi. The other end plugs into the micro USB port on the ESP32 board. The red light indicates that it's got power. Now for the software. First, please make sure the Pi is up to date. From a terminal, type sudo apt-get update and sudo apt-get upgrade. You should use the latest version of Raspbian and Jesse to ensure you have all the necessary software. A utility called ESP tool will be used to upload the MicroPython firmware. It's installed using sudo pip3 install ESP tool. I'm using pip3 to target Python 3. OK, that's successfully installed. Now type dmessage grep tty usb. This shows that a CP210X UART to USB bridge is attached to port tty usb 0. Some devices need to be put into programming mode using the push buttons on the board before you can use the ESP tool. However, I found it's not necessary on the ESP32, at least not on this one. To test the connection, type ESP tool pi double dash port slash dev slash tty usb 0 followed by the command flash ID. This queries the ESP32 for basic info such as the chip type, ESP32, and flash size, 4 megabytes. Looks like everything's okay. Before uploading the firmware, it's recommended to erase the chip. I'll use the up arrow to recall the last ESP tool command and change flash ID to erase flash. This gives us a blank slate. Okay, the chip erase completed successfully. 
A copy of the MicroPython firmware is required. You could build it yourself from the source code on the GitHub repo, but it's much easier just to download a daily build. Open a web browser and go to micropython.org. Click the Download tab. Click ESP32. Currently only one firmware is available for the ESP32. Click to download it. Once that completes, close the browser. The MicroPython firmware build was downloaded to the Downloads folder. LS shows a long file name. Highlight the name and copy it to the clipboard. I recall the last ESP tool command. This time erase flash is changed to write flash. Hex 0 specifies the starting address to write. Type download slash for the downloads folder, and then just paste in the firmware file name from the clipboard. The firmware is now being written to the ESP32. It's pretty quick, but I'll speed it up so you don't have to wait. It verified OK, so the board should be ready for coding. MicroPython boards have a read eval print loop, or REPL, which is a simple interactive programming environment. It's similar to the Python idle shell. On the ESP32, the REPL is accessed using a serial connection. Other boards like the ESP8266, which is a very popular predecessor to the ESP32, in addition to a serial REPL, also have a web REPL, which allows you to manage and program them over the web. As of this video, this feature has not yet been implemented on the ESP32, along with many other features. But new stuff is being added daily, so by the time you watch this video, there might be more options. For now, we'll stick to serial. The same USB cable that we used to program the ESP32 can also be used to access the REPL. Any serial programs such as PuTTY or Screen should work. However, these programs won't let you manage the ESP32 file system, which can be used to store your programs. Ideally, you want a program that provides a REPL terminal and also can perform file system commands. I've tried several programs and currently my favorite is rshell. It can be installed using sudo pip3 install rshell. This simple program will run on the Raspberry Pi and affords access to the REPL terminal on the ESP32. It also provides file management to transfer and manipulate files on both the Pi and the ESP32. Installation is complete. To start our shell, type our shell double dash buffer size equals 30 tac p dev tty usb 0. OK, our shell is running and is connected to the USB port. The current terminal can be used to execute file commands. For example, type boards to list all connected boards. A single board is returned with id pi board, which we'll need as a reference later. The boot pi file is automatically run in startup and contains low-level code to set up the board and finish booting. You typically don't want to edit it, however you can add a file called mainpy if you need to run your own code at startup after the boot pi. Type REPL to open the MicroPython programming environment. The terminal will now accept Python code. Print hello world, outputs hello world. Let's try something a little more colorful. The typical first program is to blink an LED. Instead of a regular LED, I'll use a NeoPixel LED. This is an RGB LED with a built-in chip to control color and brightness. It can be driven using a single data line, and it's very easy to connect to the ESP32. A 5 volt pin provides power. A 1N4004 diode is used to drop the NeoPixel voltage from 5 volts to 4.3 volts, which allows the NeoPixel to read the ESP32's 3.3 volt data output. The ESP32 3.3 volt output needs to be at least 70% of the NeoPixel's supply voltage to register commands. If the NeoPixel is running at 5 volts, then the ESP32 is below this range at 66%. But at 4.3 volts, it's good to go at 76%. A ground from the ESP32 is connected to a ground on the NeoPixel. GPIO 13 is connected to data in. Please note that a single NeoPixel can use up to 60 milliamps at full brightness. Therefore, if you want to run a strip of LEDs, I'd use an external power source to prevent damaging the board. Adafruit has several helpful tutorials regarding NeoPixels, and I'll put links up on my website. An ESP32 breakout board is plugged into a breadboard. One problem with this particular breakout board is that it's a little too wide and only one row of pins is accessible in the ESP32. They do make versions that are narrower and more breadboard friendly. The 5 volt pin from the ESP32 is connected to a 5 volt rail. A ground is connected to a ground rail. I'll add the NeoPixel ground first. It's best practice to connect the ground first and when disconnecting, the ground should be removed last. Here's an 8mm NeoPixel LED. It's placed with the flat side on the right so the third pin ground connects to the black ground jumper. A 1N4004 diode is placed between the 5V rail and the 5V pin on the NeoPixel. Again, the diode has a voltage drop of 0.7V, which ensures the NeoPixel can read the ESP32's 3.3V output. Instead of a diode, you could also use a level shifter on the data line to convert between 3.3V and 5V. 
Finally, the data in pin on the NeoPixel is connected to the GPIO 13 on the ESP32. Okay, that takes care of the hardware. Now let's write some Python code. Minimize our shell and run idle3. Create a new file. From machine, pin is imported. The pin library is very similar to the Raspberry Pi GPIO library. It lets you reference and control the ESP32 GPIO pins. From NeoPixel, import NeoPixel. This library drives NeoPixel LEDs and strips. From time, import sleep. MicroPython is a subset of Python, therefore it doesn't have all the standard libraries. For example, an easy way to cycle RGB LED colors is to vary the hue between 0 and 1. This can be done with the HSFeed RGB method, which is part of the Python ColorSys library. Since it's not included with MicroPython, I'll just paste the HSFeed RGB function into my code from the ColorSys library. HSV is a common cylindrical coordinate representation of points in an RGB color model. This function simply converts an HSV value, hue, saturation, and brightness, to an RGB value, red, green, blue. I'm not going to explain how this function works because it's not relevant to this tutorial, but all the code is on my website if you want to explore it further. A NeoPixel is instantiated on GPIO pin 13. One indicates the number of LEDs. NeoPixels are also sold in strips of LEDs, and you can control multiple using a single GPIO pin. Spectrum is a list to represent 2048 colors. This first range is 0 to 2048, and the second is 2048 to 0. A try statement to catch errors wraps the main while loop, which is infinite. A for loop cycles through the color spectrum range. Hue is set to a value from 0 to 1, which is divided into the 2048 steps. NP0 refers to the first NeoPixel LED. We only have one. If we're using a strip, we could reference other LEDs. The HSV to RGB function is past the hue, one for saturation, and brightness is set to only 15% to make it a little easier to film. MP write sets the NeoPixel LED to the specified color. The loop sleeps for 10 milliseconds and continues. Except is used to gracefully exit the program upon control C. Finally ensures the LED is turned off by setting red, green, and blue to zeros. Okay, I'll save the program. I'll call it RGB Pi and put it in the documents folder. Back in our shell, I type control X to exit the REPL, but I'm still in our shell. LS lists the contents of my home directory. CD documents switches to the folder where I saved the Python program. LS again shows the file RGB Pi. LS slash PyBoard shows the file contents on the ESP32. PyBoard is the ID for the ESP32 that we determined earlier using the board's command. Currently the ESP32 only contains the boot pi file. CP RGB pi slash PyBoard copies the RGB pi file to the ESP32. Now LS slash PyBoard shows the RGB file was successfully copied. REPL to return to the MicroPython REPL. Import RGB loads and runs the MicroPython program. Back on the breadboard, the NeoPixel is fading between colors. I need to work on my photographic skills. The actual LED colors are much more vibrant than it appears on the video, and it's cycling very smoothly. Please let me know in the comments if you want me to make more ESP32 videos, and if so, what you'd like to see. You can support this channel by subscribing, leaving a like, and sharing. Thanks for watching.